دكتور يا دكتور I yes, have a yes. question yeah. for for the instructions uh, of the term paper I have seen yep. a file on mode is it for the last semester or for this semester actually this That's is fine. from yeah this is from the last semester I may actually I may do some changes to it I will um, I will I think I will do that this week and I will um, finalize it uh, for you uh, by next week it should be it should be done because maybe there are some stuff i may do some changes here and there okay okay yeah good yeah anything um, anything else Okay, so I think I, um, yeah, I can uh, start um, sharing. Yeah, um, you can see my screen now, correct? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, last time I, I, th I think I said uh, I'm going to go quickly uh in the last final point about what damrush was talking about really the meanings and definitions and so on of world literature again i must really uh, emphasize one thing for you ladies and gentlemen today um really the idea is not to memorize these things you know it's not a matter of memorizing you know just to understand and try to see the meanings and the implications uh, of these uh, material. That is how they are going to define uh, world literature and what is really world literature. What are the criteria? What are the, you know, the standards, if you like, or the elements and so on, which we may think, you know, that this is a worthy a worthy world text, something which is really, I say, worthy. Um, and I think this is important when, when we say about that. And Damrush gave us three main um, points, if you remember, when he was saying that, that world literature is something always, as he said, uh, elliptical refraction, as you can see here, elliptical refraction of national literatures. Again, he said, uh, trans, um, literature or world literature should gain or is the text that gains in translation it should gain and if it if it does not gain then it might not be as such again this idea really is problematic because again this is to do with the translator the good translators and bad translators because there are bad translators there are commercial translators there are people who are doing it just for for money and they don't care about value <clears throat> and about really the the real meaning and uh, the the actual academic value of of that and this connects to the last point which is you know the question of uh, what is the canon and what is not and i think this is to do uh, as i say with really the function and the position and the strength of translation there are texts which really sometimes can't be translated in the real 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 sense they can but not not exactly in the real sense and i'm sure there are a lot of stuff which um i think um, which uh, uh not always um you know applicable here to say that they gain or they lose uh, in translation and i think this is something that we can always discuss there are always elements uh, pros and against these ideas you know so that's why don't think that this is something absolutely sacred something cannot be changed something that cannot be challenged nothing nothing in literature nothing in criticism is sacred you know there are always 
because it's mostly subjective, really subjective. People say, you know, the form is most important. Other people say, no, the content is most important. Others would say, no, the etc. society is most important. And others say, no, the text, uh, the, the language of the text is most important and so on. So it's really, as I'm saying, that's why we say schools of criticism, really, really schools. Uh, of criticism and this is connected to that what is and what is not world literature I think this is very clear and we have to always to be aware of that when we answer such questions okay so what I was saying that uh, you know I think I explained this about uh, texts that gain in translation and I mentioned this to you before because sometimes you know translators I think translators you know um, <clears throat> um, to some extent, I, th I, I think there are translators who are really very creators and I think they do a great job, but sometimes translation is not easy really, it's, it's a matter of really how you recreate the text in your own fashion. And I think last time I, I told you about the example that, um, you know, one of our students did a little tiny example of translation and I and I thought that was a great a great thing now uh, for example again say literary languages thus the language that either gains or loses in translation and here I think we, we repeat the same thing literature stays within its national or regional tradition when it's usually loses in translation yeah well yes but but um, uh, as I said, again, I don't know, for example, I, when I said to you, the texts that we are studying, for example, you know, the French or the German or the Italian or the Latin or the Greek or the Russian, you know, Dostovsky, I, I have, I don't know Russian, but I think I value, I value, um, you know, I value, um, I should say, really Dostovsky, because of his ideas here, not because of not because of the great Russian language that he uses. Because I don't know Russian, but I I still say that this is a great text, you know. Again, because the 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 translator really did a great job, because the language that I read in the translation in English is is fantastic and it's really lovely, and it's very poetical and very you know. Is strong so here we have a really literary literary translation absolutely lovely translation and we have that in english we have that a lot in english i mean look at for example you know dante alieri dante I, I i think we shall see that dante was translated by a great american poet and we know dante through this man who translated dante dante wrote in latin in, in, in Roman Latin language, and the why because because um, uh, Henry uh, I think Woodworth Longfellow who was the real uh, strong American American um, uh, poet who translated Dante because Dante is a poet was translated by another poet and and so on. Who's calling me here again? Let me check, please. Yeah? Alaikum salam. Aywa?
Okay, sorry for this interruption, okay? I'm sorry. Now, um, to go back uh, to the um, idea we were seeing, really, is... Um, uh, where is it? I think I lost, I lost the presentation. Let me... Let me share it again. Yeah. So I was saying about uh, the greatness of the translation, which well, if it's done by, by, by poets, then we have really a, a great job and it's going to be uh, completely different. And therefore, that's what I'm saying. It's really a creation. Um, and that's why, in this sense, it gains. So I'm not saying that all translators should be you know, absolutely poets or novelists or whatever. So there are great translators who are good uh, in, in so many ways. Uh, that is, they understand the language, how to use the language and, and so on. So this is really the idea that Damrosh here wants to say uh, in general. Now, I think the, the idea which I'm trying to, to, um, uh, to say here is, notice here, for example, to use translations means to accept the reality that texts come to us mediated by existing frameworks of reception and interpretation. We necessarily work in collaboration with others who have shaped what we read, uh, sorry, what we read and how we read it. Now, I say again, in, indeed, any works within in an earlier period in our own country uh, reach us uh, in much the same way that Walter Benjamin describes translation itself. And I think this is a good definition of translation here. And that's why I highlighted in red. I don't know if you can see it. A tr translation, notice, a translation, a tra sorry, a translation shows from the original not so much from life as from its artifact, uh, afterlife. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, you, know, you can see how you're saying that, how, how it's, its connection, if you like, or close connection to, the, to being original. Not so much from its life as much its afterlife. For a translation comes later than the original. And since the important works of world literature never find their chosen translators at the time of their origin, their translation marks their stage of continual, of continued life. Which means really here that, uh, you know, when you write something or when a novel is written, writers no normally don't know that their uh, texts are going to be translated. So the idea saying that a translator really will, will give more life or better life or will go on and on giving more life to this text uh, as, uh, of course, uh, to do with the real power of the translator. Notice a specialist equipped with ample research materials can do much to approximate a return to the world in which an old, in which in which an old or foreign poem was composed. The, general, the generalist concerned with the poems shortly after life doesn't have, uh, doesn't have the luxury or even that necessity. And, you know, he goes on and on, I think, and he gives us again the example of the Arabian Nights. Like, for example, the powerful, the powerful translation of the Arabian Nights, or Rubaiyat al-Khayyam, as we, as we know it in, in, um, in, um, in Arabic. You know, it's really originally written in Persian, you know, in, in Persian language. And the way we know it, you know, here it says, notice it's translated, for example, uh, uh, Burton, uh, a great translator, Burton, um, he translated and he called it Arabian Nights. And Fitz, Fitzgerald, again, another great, good American, sorry, um, um, yeah, uh, I think another great, um, um, I, I'm not sure, I think he's, um, he's uh, English or American, I'm not sure, Fitzgerald, I think he's, he's English. Again, 
he translated as Rubaiyat. Notice he, he used the word Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Because as we say in Arabic, Rubaiyat al Khayyam. Why Rubaiyat? Because lines in four, you know, four lines, four lines as stanzas, and so on. So the idea here is the power of the, transla the, the, trans of the translation itself, the power of the translator himself or herself really will make a difference. Exactly what I said to myself, I told you this, what I said to Damrush himself, said, I have read many horrible translations of Shakespeare. I have read many horrible translations of Shakespeare. And, you know, how can we say this is, you know, gaining? Notice here, again, we say, unlike a work of literature, translation does not find itself in the center of the language for forest, but on the outside facing the wooden, the wooded ridge, it calls into it without entering, aiming at that single spot where the echo is able to give in its own language the reverberation of the word in the alien one. I think here Walter Benjamin is, is using funny, maybe strong languages, as if to say, you know, a translator, a, a good translator is a great, is a great job, you know, is not, is not just like that, you know. And I think here, uh, the last point again, to go back to the mode of reading, I said that, detached, you notice, a set, not a set, and not a set canon of texts, but a mode of reading, a detached engagement with the world beyond our own. And, you know, I think here we said, world of literature is fully in play once several foreign works begin to resonate together in our mind. Again, the idea here to say that um, the world literature, if you like, um, if you like, when we, when we say here, resonating as because you say mode of reading a mode of reading today you read it this way and after 10 years or 50 years they will read it in that way and sometimes again uh, when you think about that's what would mean you know the idea of uh, being detached from what is fixed and from what is uh, really the original if you like um, again, we say the texts themselves exist both together, notice here, both together and alone, you know, not, not here and not there. And here we give again the example of Dante and the example of Virgil and the example of so many other writers like that, uh, if you like, to, to, to mention or to talk uh, the same about the same thing. And that's what he's saying here, he say, he say, when he said, world literature is fully in play once several foreign works begin to resonate together in our mind. This provides a further solution to the, again here, uh, to the whole idea of saying it's one or single or something like that. Uh, here would, about the comparative and to, to comparatists who are always angry or panicked about it. It's a mode of reading that can be experienced intensively. You, know, you have to feel it, you have to experience it. And this is when you say mode of reading, how you feel. You like it this one, maybe after 50 years, things will change. And I think this is the idea when we say mode of reading, how we read it. So this is the idea, it's to do with engagement. How do you, you engage with the text? And I think this is the idea, a mode of relatively direct engagement with it, aptly symbolized by efforts to acquire near native fluency in the culture's language, reading and studying world literature by contrast is inherently a more detached mode of engagement. In other words, you have to feel, you have to feel the thing to, 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 to like it. I mean, I know maybe some of you would say to me, oh, doctor, I don't like literature, really, to be honest with you, we don't like poetry. Yeah, of course, I know, there are people like that. And really, that's why here, of course, we say, and this is how you get engaged in it. This is how you feel that you are exchanging things with it. And this is the, the idea of 
how you are directly influenced or engaged or detached. You know, how you study and how you think about it. Yeah, of course. So that's why he's saying reading and studying world literature, by contrast, is inherently a more detached mode of engagement and enters into a different kind of dialogue with the work, not one involving identification or masterly, but the discipline of distance and of difference. We're not saying that you should follow the text as a slave. No, it's really the matter of understanding it. Maybe you don't like it, fine. But to understand it and say, yeah, this is a great text or this is a bad text. That's not saying you should love it. You know, and this is the deep understanding of the idea. And this is the question here of trying to, to say, I like this because it's like it's related to me, fine. I don't like it because it's far away from me, fine. Again, it's the same thing. So that's the idea we say distance and maybe difference. Notice we encounter the work not at the heart of its source culture. We, are, we don't read an English text because we want to say we are English. We are not English. We are not. We are Arabs, for example. We are not saying we should follow texts blindly. No, 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 no. You know, that's what the idea here. We should not be, you know, enslaved by the text, you know? So this is the idea. Not at the heart of its source, culture, but in the field of force generated among works that may come from very different cultures and eras. And eras. We read a play today by Shakespeare and the way we see it today in the 21st century. We see it as Omani people, for example, or as Arabs or as Muslims. Fine. Shakespeare will not dictate me how to read his play. He can't. Shakespeare is dead. Shakespeare is dead. English language is okay, we respect any other language, but there's no way that they can force me how or what to take from that text. And that's really the idea here. That's the question of what is the force that can be generated from a text to think that I can take it or I can throw it away. What I can use and what I can abuse. That's fine. That's really fine. And uh, at the end of the day, you can say here, of course, the conclusion, I think I will leave it for you, ladies and gentlemen, and that's it about this uh, introduction. I know it's a very long introduction. Maybe it's very strong introduction, but I think it should be easy. And I think it should be fine with all of you uh, boys and girls. Well, I have one boy, boy and girls um, to really understand, uh, to really understand uh, the whole thing, how uh, the matter is, is, I think, applicable to us. Now, I have actually, I have actually, let me show you, um, I have, uh, let me take this away from here, let me show you, I have another introduction, maybe I will show you this introduction quickly today, because originally, really, I wanted to show you and I gave this to you to have a look at and look at it here. I will share it with you again to, to say to you here, my own introduction. I wrote this introduction, you know, years ago to my students. My, my, I've been teaching this course for many, many years. And I think, you know, this is really an interesting introduction. And, and to me and to, to my, to, to my, to my understanding of, um, Who's sending me these messages? I can't understand this. Is just quickly to have a look because something may be important. I don't know. Yeah. This again. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So this is um, a very uh, sort of brief 
could be if you look at it you can see it uh, on my on my screen can you yes doctor yes yeah. now this is again a, a long a bit long introduction how many pages yeah 23 pages really i let i i sent it to you just to have a look um if you are interested to just have a look about how i divided world literature this is my own introduction and my own summarizing of these periods and i started with the greek literature with the pre-classical literature with homer the classical as you can see uh, homer and then aeschylus and then sophocles and then euripides and then Astrophanes and so on and so forth. You know, I started with the real big names. Again, people say to me, oh, oh come on, why are you going back to that? Well, to me, that's really, uh, that's originally what is world literature for, for many, 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 many years. People always in universities everywhere in the world, they, they studied this as, as world literature or as classical literature. So we respect, uh, other people's, um, if you like, uh, philosophies and ideas, and no problem. So here you can see the names I've mentioned, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then I stop there. Of course, as you can see, this is very brief, absolutely very brief, very brief. But I just counted the names and briefly in, for each author a little bit of summary. And then I move on to the Roman literature, to the Roman literature. Mm -hmm. Uh, because originally the classical the classical age going back to the pre-christian age uh, w w which is of course as i said in western culture remember i'm talking here about western culture i'm not talking about other cultures or chinese because our field is english literature that's why you know maybe you you would think that i have neglected many other cultures but that's not that's not intentional it is to do with the, the, you know, with the whole idea that um, um, we can't cover everything. And because, as I said, this is from the, from the English perspective. The Roman literature, again here, I give more examples there. And I start with Virgil, and maybe you shall see here, I will, we will, well, I don't give any example of that for us, but we have Ovid, uh, later on I will, you will see here Ovid, uh, we will uh, see him. Um, here, as you can see, he's uh, um, uh, an Italian Roman. Uh, and the example we shall see is Metamorphosis as a very funny and nice, uh, nice mythological, uh, if you like, um, poem. We, I gave you only a little section of it. We will, we will look at it. And then we have uh, Virgil, um, Horace, Ovid, uh, Dante Alieri. Again, Dante, we have an example of Dante, uh, the Divine Comedy, as you know. Um, again, I will come back to it. We have uh, Francesco Petrarch, uh, who was the Petrarchan poet, who was just before the Shakespearean time and the, if you like, the real founder, if you like, maybe, of the sonnet uh, form Petrarch, his name Francesco Petrarch, and then Giovanni Boccaccio. Again, I think he was a great name again in Latin and uh, Italian literature. Really, Boccaccio, especially in his great um, book of stories called Decameron, really, this is a very huge uh, text of stories and novellas. Uh, as you can see here, I say, Decameron is a collection of 100 novellas, which Boccaccio began in 1350 and finished, etc. It's a great example of narration, you know, and it was really a huge influence on English literature. That's why I think it's seen as a classical example. Now, Seneca, again, he was the father of tragedy. Seneca, and he was um, Lucius. Uh, Lucius Seneca, and for many, many people, he was the real founder of tragedy. Really, the, 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 the real, if you like, because he believed that tragedy should have blood on, on stage. Anyway, that's, um, that's uh, a lot. 
Uh, and I move on to German literature, and I have so many big names again, you know, names. And please uh, look at it here. I'm not going to mention these names. You just uh, go through them yourself, just for your information. Kafka here, uh, my friend Kafka, I wanted to give you the originally, I planned to give you this one, the Metamorphosis by Kafka, Franz Kafka. He was, uh, you know, uh, an amazing writer. He was Czech, probably, probably, you know, um, originally he was born, as you can see here, I say, born to Jew Jewish parents in Prague, Bohemia, uh, originally called Bohemia in Prague, which is in Czechoslovakia, really, originally. And, um, you know, affected strongly by by German culture and German language, of course. Um, um, and Kafka, of course, was writing in German. And really, he was a, such a great novelist, if you like. I wanted to teach, originally, I planned to give you the metamorphosis. But I thought many people, I thought, I don't know, maybe, because I taught this uh, um, twice. And students had really funny mixed reactions about this uh, small novel, which is an amazing text. I will talk about it when I talk about Ovid metamorphosis, because the word metamorphosis means how you change, how your body is changed. As we say in Arabic, al masakh how you 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 could be you could be your body, your everything could be changed. Later on, we'll talk about it in details. Okay. And uh, you have uh, big names again in German. Really, I, I can't mention all these, but as I said, I will leave it for you. French literature, again here, I begin with uh, Chrétien de Troyes, and as a great, uh, you know, the first early romance writer, romance uh, writer, and his name, as you can see, de Troyes. This is Chrétien, Chrétien de Troyes, uh, as, as a really amazing, uh, um, you know, mythological to some extent, to some extent, to some extent mythological, but he was really talking about you know these romance chivalries like Robin Hood's thing, like King Arthur, and in fact he was the first man to document King Arthur and the Arthurian legends. Really, the 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 here like the stories of the knight of the lion and Lancelot and the knight of the cart and so on and so forth and the story of the Holy Grail and Parsifal and all this to do really with to do with you know all this uh, mythological I don't know if this is true because many people think even King Arthur did not exist because it was maybe people think it's the creation of like some people say, uh, Antara did not exist. I don't know, or or um, uh, Zir Salem did not exist, or you know, people people create stories. I don't know if this is true or not, but Chrétien de Troyes really is the man who uh, gave us all these big stories and great stories about King Arthur and his men and his knights. Anyway. Um, and really, we have big names. I love French literature. You know, one day, if I was given, <laughs> I don't know, if I had time, I don't have time. I'm old enough now to go back and study literature, study French, because really, French literature is such a rich, such a rich literature, really. Rabelais, our friend, uh, uh, you know, Francois Rabelais, uh, really, as you can see, he was even before Shakespeare. He was such a huge man, really, a very big, uh, big name, uh, especially in his great book called The Life of Gangantois and Pantagruel. You know, all these giant characters. Uh, you know, his, uh, you know, here I say the story or the novel tells the story of two giants, a father called Gangantois and his son called Pantagruel, and their adventures, written in an amusing, extravagant, and satirical vein. Really, Rabelais was an amazing man, 
in his in his language in his writing and his he was such a critical sarcastic man in every sense and i think you know he was he was mocking french society in that book as i said it's a novel a huge novel really as i said uh, it's called the life of gangantua and and of pantagruel i don't know it's really very funny as i said he has a very vulgar very ugly very violent very large very obscene very horrible etc uh, you know uh, language in this but it was such an influential text on so many other writers again you know i have i have chosen only these few names because really french literature had as i said very rich really very rich so descartes i think all of us should know descartes and his idea about you know about doubt descartes and his philosophy and his philosophy you know descartes you've heard of descartes huh hello guns rene rene descartes no yeah yeah i know when he says i doubt therefore i exist ashukku is an ana mawjud huh do you know this saying by descartes yes we know it yes yeah this is uh, yeah here he say, he says it in french here um um well i don't know french i told you i'm not really i don't know french at all in fact i should not say anything but notice here i think therefore i am or i'm thinking therefore i exist and you know in arabic we we have the same and descartes was was such a big name in philosophy and so on i i don't know i mean you have so many names moliere for example moliere and racine if you like um again they were amazing dramatists um even even people um cornier um uh, i think cornier many people think that even he he, he was even more powerful shakespeare for the french um i don't know i mean this is really uh, up to you here uh, the uh, the especially in his great uh, play called lucid lucid and the, really funny it's translated in arabic as sayyid lucid as sayyid which is again it was an amazing amazing enormous popular successful play and it was i don't know it's it's really people as i said for according to the to the french he was such a big name and people think he was even the shakespeare of the french cornier moliere and racine and voltaire you know again um, uh, these book names jean jacques rousseau he, again the philosophy and talking about education and the French Revolution, Jean Jacques, Jean Jean Jacques or, or Rousseau, I don't know. Especially he's talking about the question of nobility, and he was the father of the word noble savage. You know the idea of noble savage. How can you be noble and then savage? This is really a funny, absolutely strange idea. Noble and then savage, right? um doctor their books are very hard to understand like i tried to read some of their books yeah you need to be a philosopher yeah. to understand yeah yeah i mean no you if you take time and slowly and if you really love philosophy and try to think and don't study them for exams study them because you want to study them and you love them really because because you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he was a great philosopher. He influenced so many Western philosophers after him. Notice, he was born 1712, died 1778. 
you know, he really influenced so many other people, English, Americans, Germans, many people, you know. Uh, again, he wrote a great book called Emil, his novel called Emil. And as I said, um, um, the, the, the ideas that he was talking about, mostly about civilization and about education, about morality, about equality, blah, 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 blah. You know, especially, especially his, goal, his, his book called The Social Contract. I think people still say Al-Aqd al-Ijtima'i. We still say Al-Aqd al-Ijtima'i. There is a law in our society. And I think here Rousseau established this idea about what is family, what is life, what is how we coexist. There is always a law, there is always a social contract. Even when you get married, you have a contract. You sign a contract, isn't it? So really, Rousseau talked about uh, a lot of amazing elements. Really here, I give a brief note about it in my little, in my little uh, summaries about these people. Again, Marquis de Saad, 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 his name is Saad, and he was the father of Sadism, and we say Asadiya. You know the word Sadi? In the Arabic, we say Sadi and Sadist. Huh? And the word sadism, you know the word sadism? Or somebody who is sadist? I think you know this, if you've heard of that. You know, and I think it's this word is taken from him, Marquis, Mar, Marquis or Marquise, or Marquis, or Marquis Dossard, uh, his, um, his philosophy about, uh, you know, he talks about a lot of about criminality and violence and blasphemy and blah, 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 blah. You know, and that's why really when, when, as we say with sadism, when you enjoy the torture of others, you know, we say somebody who's sadist, who really enjoys the torture and the, and the pain to cause the pain and torture to other people. We, 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 because he was talking about this idea of, which is again, we have what we call Again, if you like masochism, which is to enjoy the torture on yourself, which is again very, very ugly and very crazy thing to talk about. Anyway, the, there are a lot of stuff here. Uh, please, you can look at that. I, I have no I, no time for this. Um, please look at those quickly because they really they are lovely. Uh, they are big names. Again, uh, here we have Jean Paul Sartre. Jean Paul Sartre, who was the father of existentialism. Sartre, we shall see later. Um, he was, I say, the father of existentialism. Later on, I will, I will come back to Dostoevsky and tell you that Dostoevsky really uh, was, to many people, um, was even more powerful than, than Sartre. But Jean Paul Sartre, uh, you know, develop the whole idea in a very strong way uh, about the question of um, the question of existentialism and the philosophy of, ex of existentialism and so on. You know, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, what else? There are many things, really. Um, and then I moved to the Spanish, and then to Russian, and then I think that's it, because um, I, have, I have a lot of names. Please, uh, please uh, give me maybe a day of your precious time. Give me one day of your, of, of your precious time, please. Give me one day to read this just for 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 fun and for enjoyment please because really it's such a lovely introduction and i really really believe it or not i worked on this introduction i worked on this introduction a long 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 time believe it or not really weeks and weeks to have done this uh, little introduction so that's why i feel it's really like uh, 
you know, I, I feel that it's so dear to my heart and I always w want people to look at it and read it briefly. Of course, you can find a lot of other stuff. Um, I mean, this is not, um, you know, something uh, I'm saying that is the only thing you can find. Today, you can find volumes and volumes and volumes, amazing texts. Now, today, uh, boys, um, well, one boy, um, ladies um, and gentlemen, today I will move on to our first example of what we call world literature. Any question before I move on to Safiya al -Hulu? Questions? Before I move on to my friend Safiya, the Sudanese, young Sudanese, lovely Sudanese American poet. Huh? This young, this young, huh? Okay, so no, no question. Now, uh, girls, please, can you, um, anybody looked at Safiya al Hulu here in this, uh, in this introduction? Yes. yes. What do you think? What do you think? Um, it's my first time hearing about this lady, actually. So I read her poem. Uh, I found it kind of weird in the first place, maybe due to the structure that the poem is written. And there are many poses. But honestly, I think she had yeah, succeeded in transmitting her tragedy and sorrow through this. Um, kind of weird for me writing style but honestly i enjoy it very good yep thank you very much yep yes very good yeah anybody else any comments zainab you want to say something no doctor you sure <laughs> yes okay any comments any comments? Hmm. Um, I think she's uh, a successful girl because she she got, she ha, she ha, she has she has done a lot of things at a young age. I think she's now. I don't know how old she is, but she did a great. Well, she's, thing. she's your age. She's about uh, I twenty-four. Think she's I think. 20s, 23, well, I'm not, I'm saying, uh, sorry, I'm not saying your age exactly, but I mean, she's still a young lady. She was, she, she went there. I, I'm not sure when exactly, to be honest, again, I'm not sure. But um, let me see. Uh, I think I have here in the introduction, did I say something about her? Where did she go to, um, to America? I'm not sure. Um, anyway, um, she, uh, yeah, she has done a great job. She's still a young lady. She went to America to study and then she started because she's a poet. You know, she, um, um, if you like, really, uh, because she is such a creator or a creative writer, uh, you know, she started to write uh, good poetry, of course, modern poetry, you know, 21st century poetry. It's a very different very different poetry uh, uh, as uh, Tihal said yeah of course she um, she's writing she's writing of course um, um, let me see um, yeah I'm just looking at um, to check exactly, I must I must Google her name and check if I can find more references about her um, about the time she went to, or I'm not sure when she went to America, uh, but she was born uh, in Sudan, and really she is a Sudanese national, um, but um, uh yeah I mean the the poetry that she's using the poetry that she's writing is quite uh, revolutionary 
in terms of the form and the style and the shocking form, if you like, the way she's doing it. And I think it's done deliberately to say that, you know, this crazy technique of writing poetry these days is, is an amazing thing. And, and people um, really, um, um, sometimes, as I said, um, you have no idea how people sometimes they give you or they shock you how to um, to write poetry. Now, again, here to come back to the idea and ask you ourselves: Is is this a a world text? I don't know. You know, I don't know. But people sometimes, since you start to go back and back and forth, back and forth, you know, um, sh the way she is being read and being treated and being used and you may achieve some kind of popularity you may achieve some kind of being known and become popular you know step by step slowly by by you know you can become if you like popular to some extent and therefore you can be translated uh, our friend here uh, Safiya al Hulu is writing in English and she's not this her text we are reading it in english uh, but of course her background is sudanese her background is african her background is poor uh, you know society african society poor society and showing us this all this in english you know through um, you know in the background of the american context she's writing in america for American audience, for black Americans. And, you know, so she could be seen as any American, as any black American writer. So I don't know if we can call her a world text. I don't think so. I do not really think so. But can we find values? Are we, are we tempted to say, wow, yeah, it's lovely, yeah, and so on. The appeal, do we have the appeal? Do we love this? Do we say, wow, great ideas, great, you know, the idea here again, how we receive this? And according to all the definitions we have seen, since this is not translated from other texts, from other cultures, then we say, mm, yeah, well, I don't know if this is a world text. I would not say a world text. Maybe I would say maybe 30% or 20% being a world text, maybe. But who would, uh, as Tihal said, I've never heard of Safiya al Hulu. Yeah, I've never heard of her myself, to be honest with you. I have taken this from my colleague, and you know, she said to me, whoa, there are you know many good examples when, when I started to you know, doing this, they said we need to put some strange, modern, contemporary something, you know, African or Arab or Western or whatever um, sources. And they said, OK, no problem. You know, and I discovered this, of course, through her own suggestion. Uh, thanks to her, of course. And I, I thought this is a nice uh, example. But you, can, you see, you can have so many other examples. Today, I can give you hundreds of examples of Arab Americans, Arab Americans writing in America. And in fact, writing in America, some of them writing in Arabic, some of them writing in English or in any other culture. Even you have an Omani, for example, person here writing in English, in Oman, writing in English. Well, so what? You know? So the idea really here we want to say. Um, it's really too early to say, too early to say that Safiya al Hulu is a well world text. But I am saying here that, yeah, there are ideas, there are good stuff, maybe strange, weird stuff, yes. But you see, the poems that she's writing here, as you can see, this, for example, a collection or a section from, um, you know, if you, if you again check on the net, I've taken this from the net, to be honest, you can see it here, uh, the... Um, you know, um, uh, when I uh, found that, uh, the uh, poems, uh, if you like, 
uh, they are um, there to to be used for for uh, you know academic reasons i copied some of those for you here and this is a section from a poem called girls that never die girls that never die and when you look at this you wonder i mean there is heavy topic here there is a heavy topic here really a very important topic here somebody somebody uh, you know here is going to be is being punished to death and punished to death by throwing stones by stoning that girl what did she do why are you know why are they stoning her all her people stoning her her society everybody including <laughs> and mainly including her father and her father was the one who you know who was the strongest if you like i think it's very bad even to say your father you know normally girls look at their fathers as the great men who protect them not to stone them to death normally 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 girls they look up to their fathers as the great men who would you always protect them you know who always say wow my daddy did this to me my daddy bought me this and my daddy my daddy isn't it and that's true that is true and here the shocking thing is her daddy was the first he was throwing the hardest and the strongest and the most harmful stone on her what did she do what did she do we have no idea we have no idea we are not told in the poem and Sophia did not tell us could be something yeah could be something yeah could be could be but we don't know again look at the format look at the format and the gaps and the rhyme and no no punctuations no capitalizations no rhyme uh, no system whatsoever you have uh, as you can see each two lines together yeah but where is the rhyme no rhyme why why are these gaps where is again the sentences the sentencing you know the full stops nothing nothing okay again i think i'll read this for you and we'll see a girl a girl buried to the chest in red earth her wrists bound beneath the soil with the twine a crowd gathers to father her what to father her here really the word father as a verb her infinite hands curved loosely around a stone small enough that no single throw is named as cause of death why no no nobody knows no single throw is named as cause of death no single hand accountable to the blood the girl the girl and daughter unnamed unfaced undone from the lineage her photographs pulled already from shelf from bookshelf from walls her father among the hands his papal streaked with quartz the first to rise to carve the air and arc toward that girl the rootless tree faceless and erect and perhaps the stones twisting like fireworks the girl their their nucleus rise and rise for a time opposite of rain opposite of hail opposite look at this opposite of hail and perhaps the silence a beating too long 
and another, another, and then rustling of wings above the girl, a flock, thick, mixed cloud of avifauna, partridge, niger, and golden sparrow, avocet, and lapwing of every other sort of plover, ibis, and heron, and gulls through the sea, is far to the north, and minutes pass, the girl is untouched. Each bird in its beak tongues a stone. Allahu Akbar, tongues a stone. Why if I will not die? <laughs> Why if I will not die? What will govern me then? How to govern me then? How bounty, what bounty then on my name? What stone, what rope, what man will be my officer? What? Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? Everybody is uh, stoning her, including the birds, for God's sake. You know, all these birds, she, she mentioned many, many names of birds. You know, wings above the girl, flock, and all this, you know, avifauna, partridge, night jar, you know, sparrow, avuset, lapwing, blah, 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 all of them. You know, heron, gulls, all of them having stones in their peak. You know, she said, notice, and their big tongues. And here, really, using the word tongues as a verb. Tongues, a stone, meaning holding a stone in their, in their peak and throwing the stone on me. And here, the girl, you know, she's challenging everybody. She, <laughs> what if I'm not going to die? You can't kill me. Your stones will never kill me. Your stones will not kill me. Huh? What if I don't die? She said. What if I don't die? What if I will not die? What if nobody can govern me? Nobody can control me. What do we do? What do you do? What can you do? What bounty? What my name again? What stone? What rope? What man will be my officer? Yeah, really she is challenging a very strong, a very absolutely strong poem, really challenging and defending society, society which kills her, stoning her to death. Huh? Yeah, and again, notice how she said everybody is stoning her to death. We go back to saying, you know, why is there mawuta to suilat, isn't it? Bi ayi then bin qutilat. Hmm? Well, ideas, ideas sometimes you say, come on, come on. Why do you want to, to torture me and to kill me? It's like blah, 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 blah. And, and really this is, an amazing, lovely, absolutely lovely, strong poem. She is talking about a girl, and again, notice, girls, not just girl. And then she said, a girl buried to the chest in red earth. You know, really, this is a very challenging, a very challenging poem. To society, why do we kill our girls if, <laughs> I mean, really sometimes this is this is very tough and very strong to say, but really here, uh, Safir al-Hulu is challenging all the rituals, all the traditions, all the ugly maybe traditions, all the terrible traditions, if you like, all the ills of society, 
which may be, may, may be, which may be, you know, make people commit something against their own kids, against their own people, you know, which is really terrible. So here, really, I think Sophia is posing a strong question against her society. Stop stoning people for no real, absolutely clear reason. Stop killing people for nothing. For mere, for mere and maybe sheer suspicion. And maybe mere and sheer maybe gossip and rumors and maybe nothing clear you know you can't punish people to death for no reason for no reason and that's why here you know she's highlighting this in a very strong way buried to the chest in red earth even her hands were bound were, were, were tied, she said, with twine. A crowd, you know, a lot of people gathering around. A crowd gathers to father her, to look at her as if, again, they, you know, as if all of them are like her parents watching her. Again, it's infinite hands, meaning this crowd, this crowd has so many hands, say infinite, many, 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 many hands were ready to throw the stones. Curved loosely around a stone, throwing stones at her. So here the question she is rejecting this bedeviling of this woman, rejecting the bedeviling of women. We can't be devil our women for no clear reason. It's a shame to be devil our women in this way, according to Safiya al And I think maybe she has a message here. Could be, we could agree, we could disagree, you know, it's up to us. But really this idea of bedevilment is important. And this, this really question here of demonic thing and demonization of women and really demeaning and this dehumanizing women is the question here. Not just dehumanizing and de bedeviling, but killing. Small enough that no single throw is named to cause of death. They didn't give her the reason. What did I do? Right? No single hand. Not even not because it's as you say, you know, all the society. And I think it's, uh, it's really very clear. I don't think I need to explain it anymore. Um, I will leave it for you to, to react and really to, to think about it in a very lovely way. Well, in this way, we say, as I said, looking at the meanings, looking at the concepts, looking at the ideas, Whatever you can say about this poem, yeah, we say, wow, well, that's a great text. That's a very good example. But as I said, because it's not translated, because it's not read from, uh, you know, yet, because it's a new text, you know, just maybe two years old, as you can see, two or three years old, two years old. So, yeah. Um, Maybe you can say, yeah, it could be, it would be a world text after 50 years. Could be. I don't know. Okay. Again, the next one called Yasmin, and I think it's a very great, uh, again, a very nice poem. Um, again, look at the format of it. Yeah, I gave you three examples, but I read Yasmin quickly for you. Again, really, it's a lovely, it's a lovely poem. Um, girls, can I ask you a, a, a good question here, all of you? Huh? Yes, you, you like can. It? Yes, you, you can. Are you happy with your names? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who said no? Who said no? Sarah? No, not me. Someone said. Someone yeah. else. I said yeah. no. Optihan? Yes. You don't like your name. <laughs> no. I will give you two marks extra, yeah, Optihan. You are very good <laughs> because you are courageous to say things. Very good. Well done. Well, you see, this is it. Sometimes people, sometimes you are given a name. You did not choose your name, isn't it? So really the idea here, this, this again, this poem here is about naming ourselves. How do we name, right? How do we name? Even my own children ask me sometimes, why did you call me Farah? Because I have two girls, Farah and Dana. And sometimes they say to me, what, why Farah or what, you know, or Dana, what's Dana, huh? You know, I don't know. I mean, this is the idea that people sometimes, people sometimes wonder about, um, <laughs> oh no, 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 Afrah, your name is good. <laughs> don't say that. No, I'm saying that really, really here, I'm not, I'm just, I'm joking with you just to, uh, to see. Because that's the meaning of this poem. Her name is Yasmin. She said, my name is Yasmin. And they say, why do you call me? Yeah, Akhlas wants to say something? Me, I want to say something. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah. This is what I am worried about in the future. That my children will say, why you call me like this? Why you didn't choose uh, like another name for me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is funny. This is funny. I think this is this is really normal, you know, because we give we give names. We don't choose our names. Yeah, we give names, and maybe we are. I mean, we have to. We have to, and kids should never ask this question and should never really worry about these names. I mean, we have a law in many. I think in many countries we have a law that if you really don't like your name, you can go and change it. You can ring. You can, yeah, you can, you can, you can really um, ask the court to change your name and they will change it for you. And it happened many times. I know people who did it. In real life, I know people who did it. That's normal. And I think this is, this is very natural. And here this poem, Yasmin, she said, why they call me Yasmin? Notice, I was born, I was born at the rupture, the root where I split from my parallel self. I split from the girl I also could have been, and her name, Easy. I know the story. All her life, my mother wanted the girl named for a flower whose oil scents all our mothers <laughs> petals run for their perfume i was planted land became ocean became land anew its shape profusing root in my fallow mouth cleaving my life neatly and my name taken from a dead woman to remember to fill an aperture with cut jasmine in a bowl, our longing, our mother's wilting, garlands hanging from their necks. <laughs> okay. I will come back to this next time. I will comment on it next time briefly, but I'll stop here today, ladies and gentlemen, and I uh, will leave you to um, to go because I think I think you are all you are all here. Any any absent people? Huh? I don't know. I have. Um, let me see. Yeah, I have twenty five. Yeah, that's that means we are all here. Correct. We are all here. Correct. Yeah. Right, any question? I'll stop recording and and that's it for today.